Cool. So, hey, Zav, thanks for making the time to speak to us. Um, yeah, with pleasure. It's, hello, thanks for taking the time yourself, too. Yeah, well, it's good to see you. I know you're a busy man at the moment. Well, it's, if I'm not busy right now, when am I going to be busy, right? <laughs> There's good snow everywhere, so it's time to, to move around and get up there. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, yeah, I thought, well, maybe, I mean, I think uh, it's hard to have missed some of the stuff you've been up to over the last uh, few seasons, some, some great stuff and great coverage of your projects. But, uh, yeah, maybe just for those who don't know you, maybe just give us a bit of an intro of uh, how, you, how you got into snow sports and your background. Yeah, well, it, that starts quite a few years ago, 36, uh, well, 35 years ago or something like this. Yeah, I started when I was... Uh, two years old, so actually my math is wrong because I'm 36. But <laughs> anyway, 34 years ago, and um, yeah, I, I, I grew up in the in the French Pyrenees, so um, uh, in a ski resort called Saint Marie, and uh, I've been, you know, like any kid from a ski resort, I've been going to ski club and do ski do ski racing, and then at some point I've been bored with the the fact of um, uh, doing gates all the time when there was powder out there, when there was jumps and things like this, and I wanted to discover a bit more, and snowboarding gave me that. So then, um, I don't know, I've just um, I've just been loving it, and I've been doing comps when I was young. Uh, I've always been touching a lot of, like, all the disciplines in snowboarding, freestyle, high, pine, and then I got into border cross. But I've always been dreaming of all those peaks that I could see in the background, and I've always been dreaming of being able to ride them, or access them and, and ride them, and, and that dream has become true slowly. And since, since 15 years, I'm uh, doing snowboard films, so free ride films, big mountain, and, um, and since maybe eight years, I'm producing my own films. So in a way, kind of creating my own adventures, and, and I'm now able to tell my stories, tell my vision share it and, and I'm having a blast. Yeah, oh well, yeah, we came to see your film, uh, the premiere in uh, London the other month. Uh, amazing, amazing stuff uh, with, uh, what do you call them, the, the stuff you were, you were flying? <laughs> yeah, the paramotors, yeah, that, that, that has been a bit of a crazy one. You know, we always try to find new angles to, to kind of change the practice, to see what can we try new, to, to be fresh, to, to experiment things, because I think that's very exciting in there. We used those paraglide, which is like Paracel, with an engine in the back, a big fan, and we were taking off in a tandem system, and then we were just dropping into our lines, so jumping from the paramotor into our lines, riding down, and we had drones at the same time, capturing all of that, and we're in the middle of Alaska in a camp. It was um, pretty full on, yeah, it was amazing. You, you make it sound amazing, but even that, I'm not sure does it justice, so if, uh, if anyone hasn't seen <laughs> Degrees North, I highly recommend checking it out. So, uh, yeah, it was some pretty original stuff in there. Um, so yeah, so where, where are you right now? So now I'm at home in, in Verbier, and uh, I just came back from Ispo, and I was in Chamonix last week with Aurelien Ducro, who is uh, another fat ambassador. And I'm about to go somewhere, but I don't know where, so I'm actually brainstorming uh, where is there good snow, where is it stable, where, there, where is there good terrain, and where can I have a nice adventure. Well, that's uh, kind of perfect for, uh, for the conversation we wanted to have today, to understand a bit more about how, how you do that. Um, but I guess maybe first you tell us a bit about the DIY project because uh, that's, that's your project for, for this winter, right? Yeah, true. So um, this winter uh, I'm basically doing a series that's completely the opposite of what I've been doing before. Before I've been known for going with kind of big crews with really high level of camera equipment and, and, um, and a high quality of production. And now I'm going to something that's completely DIY made. So that, that's why the... The title is DIY Do It Yourself. So, what am I gonna do myself? I'm gonna film myself with my wife. So we're gonna, we're traveling in a camper van uh, through the whole the whole winter, chasing for snow. And uh, we've been developing this drone since two years. Uh, so it's a drone that follows you automatically. It's called Hexo Plus, and that's been an incredible uh, entrepreneurial story. But whatever, the point is that now we have a really cool drone that follows you, that you put in the air with your phone and that follows you all the way down while you ride and, and captures you. Wow. And uh, because of that, 
yeah, I've been thinking that this is the best opportunity to be able to, to have the real freedom that we want to have in the mountains. So not have to organize every day before you go riding for a filmer, a cameraman, and uh, like all the logistics of transportation and everything. But uh, to being able to just go out every day like anybody that loves skiing would do and just capture your adventure when it's the right time, when it's good for you and, and throughout the whole winter. That's yeah. amazing. So you can basically, anyone can, uh, can make a film like a pro, right? DIY style. Yeah, exactly. With this system, yeah, before having yourself shot from, uh, from the air, used to be uh, like a professional level. You needed a helicopter or a really good drone pilot and um, quite a lot of money, quite a lot of effort to organize it. And now it's just available. You I just wear it in the, on the backpack and I just ride the whole day with it. And then when it's the right moment, when there's a good line, I just pop it out and just does the job by itself. Makes GoPro sound so last year. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, GoPro are working on a solution now, so let's see what they come up with. But um, yeah, so far we've got a pretty exceptional uh, solution. Yeah. Cool, and so just it's working now, right? So that you're, you, you're riding with it and it's following you autonomously yeah. on its own? And it yeah, 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 totally. I've been using it actually in the north face of the Aiguille de Midi in between two rappels. But it was not really snowboarding, you know, so that's something we did with uh, Aurelian. So it's the big north face. Um, of the uh, it's very mythical, very big, very cold, very um, aggressive, and and like being able to fly with it in there was definitely a statement that the thing is uh, working hard and that we're going to be able to go literally anywhere. Wow! Yeah, yeah. I've uh, seen seen the footage yesterday. In fact, so it's, uh, yeah, it looks really cool and amazing that you've made uh, made that actually happen and made that work. Mm -hmm. So. You said you're traveling around, I guess, looking for the next destination. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so how do you, have you decided where you're going yet? No, 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 no. We had uh, some very exotic destinations in mind. Uh, we're thinking of going to either Macedonia or Mount Etna in Sicily. But uh, yeah, right now it doesn't seem to be the right moment. There was snow a bit before in, in in Etna, but it still needs a good refresh and it's not going to come for the next 10 days. And Macedonia seems a bit flat, so so it's not good right now. So we need to brainstorm a bit more. And it, yeah, it, it's annoying because yeah, since the beginning of the season, it's more around uh, like the northwest part of the Alps that is good. So around Chamonix Verbier, but at the same time, this project is based on traveling, going where the snow is. So <laughs> we're a bit like... <laughs> Should we just stay home? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so how, and so, how do you go about? Well, like, well, how do you go about discovering new areas? Um, what do you use? Uh, where, where do you get your inspiration from? Well, usually, you, I get my first inspiration from you know, like conversations that you get here and there. You see a photo from here and there, and then uh, once you know that one area is more or less good, then you're going to go a bit more into details to see what the terrain is actually like and you're going to try to look for a specific line that's going to be um, kind of a target in a way. Okay, and, so, uh, all right, so you're looking for a specific line. Yeah, usually, yes. So it might not be the line that you would go, like, uh, that you would go to straight away, but it could be something that could be your main mega objectives so you probably go there go around there ride a bit in the area assess the conditions you know kind of realize what is the real scale of the place and then maybe also uh, work your way up towards this big objective so you for example start with mini line with a really scenic runs and things and then gradually uh, step things up until you can go really big Wow. And, yeah. uh, and what are you like? Is there in a particular kind of line you're looking for? Like, what is the criteria? What, what's uh, what, what uh, is good? To be honest, I don't think there is a, a real criteria in choosing a line because I think a line has got always the main, um, the main thing about our line is always the aesthetic of it, I think. And uh, the aesthetic of it is something that's really variable, especially that the condition on the mountain change all the time with the snow, with the light, with uh, you know how the wind has been hitting it, and, and also how your mood is and how your riding is. So you try to combine a bit all of that to uh, kind of find that something that kind of uh, attracts you and that matches 
with your style and it's um, something that happens naturally I don't know it's like I, I quite often compare it to watching um, a piece of art and you don't know why some piece of pieces of art uh, you, you you feel attracted by them and some of others they could be super technical super everything but you have absolutely no uh, no feeling with them so I think it's a bit the same I think uh, the mountains is something that's quite personal and the way you appreciate it the way you see it and that's that's the beauty of it I think yeah I guess it's coming from the heart and not not so much the head there's, an, there's not a tick box it's just you know when it's right well I I think the first thing is to think with the heart, but then when, once you actually want to go through it and write it, then you need to use your head. Yeah, right. And yeah. so, yeah, maybe talk to us a bit about, it'd um, be great to understand a bit about how you go about planning for a trip. So once you've found the destination, like what, what are the stages you go through to plan? So I guess when you start switching to the head. So yeah, once you start uh, switching into the brain, you need to think how I'm gonna. You you need to kind of make a, an attack plan in a way. So so it's like you need to figure out how you're gonna get to the top. Where are gonna be the dangers in the face? Where are gonna be the key places? Where are gonna be the escape points? And kind of try to see if uh, the conditions and all the infos you have will match with with your plan, and if actually it's a plan that works for sure that might work or that will not work and um, according to this other either you adjust or you just don't go or something like this but it's a it's a very key moment all the preparation uh, and quite often I say that uh, you know when you, once you're at the top strapped in ready to go most of the work has been already done so do you start yeah. planning like I don't know when you when you choose where you're gonna go are you gonna is the planning process gonna start now before you even set off well, I think it's never, uh, nothing happens at a very set moment, but uh, you start to have an idea and then you work your way towards it slowly. Um, and I would say that, uh, yeah, you have a plan and then you validate it throughout the way. And, uh, and basically, the more you prepare things before, the more you validate uh, most of the points before. And I think the more chances you have to... Uh, to succeed at the end but but quite often it also works really like by going there checking it out feeling that it's good and going for it and 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 also some yeah it depends the level of what you, what you want to do how the conditions are if the conditions are really easy sometimes it's just easy so it depends on the scale of the terrain as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some things can be really accessible really easy and with several options so you can adapt yourself really easily but some stuff it's a full day mission uh, you know, with one single goal, and, and there it needs to be quite ready. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds like um, you know you've got so much experience, and over the years you've kind of obviously built up the experience to, um, you know, like you say, kind of go through this complex process and, and know how to make judgments which which need experience. And how you kind of as you were as you were going through building that experience, like what, is there any advice you'd have for people who are trying to go out and have their own adventure and how, like, that they can kind of take from the journey you've been on and how they can start to, to, to make those judgments themselves? Well, I don't know. To me, there's one thing that I try to, uh, to do is I'd always try to calculate a bit, to be a bit over paranoid compared to well, I, I, well, let's say that I would rather be a bit paranoid rather than super positive and, oh, it's going to work fine and, and stuff because I've learned that you get so many surprises. So if you're a bit too positive, too much on the fun side of things, uh, it's great and this is the way it should be. But unfortunately, the reality is that you kind of need in the mountains to be trying to imagine where the danger could come all the time. So that means that you should be kind of aware of everything that's around you. And I think by, by being a bit paranoid in a way, makes you be always like looking at everything and trying to imagine all the different possible scenarios all the time. And, uh, and of course, um, uh, the less information, the more you should be like this, and uh, and the more information you have, the more you're able to be in control and kind of um, chill down and, and, and leave the moment the way it is. Mm. Uh, 
And how do you go, like when you've picked your destination, I guess like you talked about conditions, super important, uh, the conditions aren't right uh, over in Etna, I think you said. And so how do yeah. you, well, what's this, what do you, how do you go about making that judgment or finding out information about that? Well, for example, from Etna, I spoke to a guy that was there a few days ago and he said it was good, but it became warm. And then I can see that it uh, hasn't been snowing since then, and it will not be snowing until then. And it's a place that kind of gets the heat, uh, you know, where the snow gets affected quite quickly. So it's it's quite an obvious choice. And then that's one point. But otherwise, uh, you always need kind of someone that's on the terrain to really tell you, because it's really difficult to read all the avalanche reports and to know for sure what's been going on, mm. because. Yeah, if you look at the weather thing, it's always a matter of what's been happening over the last uh, week or so, that's, uh, or, or more, like to, to be to being able to judge what the conditions are. And still, uh, you need to talk to people that kind of trust that have the same vision as you, and it's always a tough thing because, um, mm. you know, some people they could tell you one thing, but then you ski something that's going to be completely different, a terrain that's going to be completely different. You know, someone that has been going ski touring on a south-facing mountain, uh, for example, in Chamonix, and then someone that will, and you are going to be wanting to ride, for example, the north face, which is really steep, much higher, much more exposed to wind, so it will have nothing, no comparison with the conditions. So you always need to bring in as many factors as you can and, and kind of guess the conditions a little bit because it's never a sure thing until you're out there. Yeah, so I guess you can you can only know when you once you get there and you put your feet in the snow and I think so, yeah. Snow, right. Yeah, yeah. But but always the more information you have the better. So so yeah. But but it will never be a 100% uh sure thing. Yeah, it's very interesting but, to know. I mean, I guess yeah, it sounds like it's kind of you're looking at past weather, uh the the, the temperature in the past and currently the the weather that's coming up try and get some yep. local knowledge, uh, information about the snowpack, but it sounds like talking to people is, is, is critical. Yeah. And we, yeah, it's very interesting for us because we're just, we're constantly trying to think like, you know, in the whole planning phase of going on an adventure, we're trying to um, pull, pull together the better information and better tools for people to, to do the planning. So it's, it's, yeah, super interesting to see how, how you're doing it. Yeah. Um, and, and then how, how, um, what other tools are you using to judge um, safety? So it's like conditions, okay, the conditions are good, like, but how safe is it? Well, I think, um, so um, I guess that uh, once you know more or less how the snow is, you need to figure out uh, kind of the physical shape of your run, and that's when maps uh, become uh, important in your thing. So. Um, so like of course like to being able to judge the conditions so you have all the friends and everything you have the snow reports and all of that you gather everything and you think you have an idea of how the snow is and then you're going to have to adapt this to your run and that's when you figure out basically the the physical shape of your run so for example if it's more like kind of ridges uh, what exposition if it's more like south facing west facing whatever uh, the pitch of the the snow, mm -hmm. uh, of the of the angle of the slopes and and uh, and the glaciers and and all of that, all these physical information. So, I guess that before we only had maps that were uh, kind of more or less good depending on the countries. In some countries, you even didn't have them, and with this, you could see the gradient so that you could kind of read them if you were very really experienced. But it was not ideal. Uh, and then I would say that uh, we've been using also a lot Google Google Earth, uh, which was kind of a way to have a rough idea also, a bit more three-dimensional, but, but still with not uh, necessarily a perfect uh, um, precision into the, the drawings. And then now with FabMap, we're, like, it's pretty nice because you have a, a full, really precise uh, 3D vision of your run. And for example, you know, I, I was putting some runs in there that uh, I have been going, I've been seeing for years and years and years, for example, in Chamonix or areas like this, and you go in front and you never know if they go through because you never go until the, you know, like you need to climb the mountain that's in front 
to being able to see that there is a passage that goes and that with this you know exactly uh, what's going to be the gradient like because you have different colors and things and uh, if the core one narrows down if you need to do a rappel what would be the size of the rappel so it's actually something that just started but that that is opening um, you know, so many possibilities to be able to, to explore really in details when you're looking for special lines like that. And, um, and I think it's really cool also because reading um, like a map on paper is one thing, but it requires uh, your brain, for your brain to kind of do the transfer from the 2D into the 3D. And that's, uh, that's not always easy and it's always really difficult to get the scales right. And I think that with a 3D uh, mapping, that um, you know, that becomes a completely different story, a lot, lot easier. Yeah. Well, I have to say that's um, yeah, it's great to hear. It's uh, particularly exciting, like to for us to hear that you're, you know, with the amount you've done in the Chamonix Massif and the, the you know the Verbia Massif, and you're still you're able to gives you a tool to discover new lines. I guess that's um, that's what we really wanted to to do at the heart of it was. Um, help people yeah. go and have a, an adventure further or inspire them to go on new, uh, you know, push their boundaries into to new things. No, but seriously, you can be so proud because it's, uh, it's a big, big, big thing. And uh, it's so easy, so quick to go and, and look for, for new stuff. Whereas I think in the mountains, it's so easy to, to just come back to doing the same thing because there, there's this area that you know, which is usually the area that you can see in your normal ski run, so you basically go there because you know exactly how it is. Right. But there, because of such a, because of like a 3D mapping like the, the FATMAT system, you can literally prepare like and check everything at home before and you have the perfect idea of what you're going to get. Yeah. You know, you, I think, you know, and, and for us, the other thing is sometimes with lines that are complex, uh, the finding the entrance point is sometimes difficult. It looks okay when you're looking from the bottom or whatever, and if you've accessed yeah. it from the top, making sure you're entering the right place. Um, can, can, it's not always obvious on a map. Um, yeah. that kind of um, having the reality view can, can help. But, um, yeah, but, and it doesn't need to be very technical of a run. Sometimes it can be basic run, but it could be dramatic if you miss, yeah, like the one point where you need to exit or, or things like this, or if you take the wrong couloir or something like that. And it's it's not even that because um, in a way these kind of things you could if you work on it you could figure it out but it's the fact that it becomes so easy it kind of pushes you to go exploring yeah. that's the cool that, that's the main part I think and you know you require less less experience in card reading to being able to find new things and find new terrain and that's uh, that's such um, yeah super in encouraging to go exploring and that's great. Yeah, and what uh, like it, you know, it's so great to hear you know people like yourself who are really pushing pushing boundaries and this opening up new possibilities. What we'd love to hear, uh, what you want to see in the future. Like, where where could, where would, if it where would you love to see it go? Where would you take it? Well, I think for now, I would like to being able to to see to have it literally everywhere. So now, right now, it's like. Like the the, the, um, the geographical zone where everything is mapped is growing, and it's like localized in the biggest ski resort. And then slowly, I'd love to see it get bigger in Europe and into the the main uh, mountain ranges in the world, because um, I think like you know usually around the resort you have like ideas of the terrain, and then the further away you go from there the more difficult it is to, to gauge how a, how a mountain range is. And I would love to be able to, to have this uh, quality of um, 3D mapping, for example. Let's say if I want to go to Antarctica, I just go in there and I just go around all the peaks and I can already pre-choose my lands. It would, it would open uh, exploration to a, to a new level, I think. Wow. So I think, yeah, that's definitely on our agenda. I think we slowly increasing our areas we 
plan to start mo moving towards more of a, like a continuous map. So at the moment, like we have distinct maps, like you say, so yeah. uh, Chamonix, Verbier, and it's all focused around ski resorts. Um, as we move into our summer products, which uh, will be around like hiking, trail running, biking, that will start to open up more and more terrain because these places don't have boundaries like a ski resort, right? Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I think next year you should start to see um, kind of, I guess, major national parks in there um, and, cool. and further. Um, I guess we'd love to, uh, uh, what we'd love to offer is, you know, if you are heading out to uh, Antarctica or Alaska or whatever, then we'd love to create um, a map specifically for somewhere you're heading and see. Uh, oh, that would be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're trying that for the first time this year. We're, a few of us are heading uh, on a kind of a mini expedition to Greenland. So, cool. um just an area kind of uh, northeast or northwest of Kulasuk. And uh, okay. so we'll see, we'll test it out. But um, yeah, well, love, to, really love cool. to hear where you want a map, that, that somewhere you want to go. We'd love to, to create it for you. I will definitely keep that in mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so cool. Um, so yeah, what's it? So the, the rest of the season is all about finding new areas, uh, DIY drone filming. Yeah, and, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, what I'm going to go in Russia soon uh, with my little brother, make a trip with him. And then, uh, yeah, we, we're kind of planning to go to the Pyrenees, maybe, and maybe go to Norway at the end of the season okay. and spend a full month up there, like go and go around the fjords, find, find lines above the sea, go surfing, and, yeah, I don't know, enjoy, enjoy life. Yeah. Nice. We were just, whereabouts in Norway are you heading? Uh, everywhere. We'll see, depending where the conditions are. Yeah, around the Lofoten or yeah, Lingen, yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Cool. We were just uh, we were just starting to plan our Lingen map yesterday, so. <laughs> uh, it looks wicked. Cool. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, that would be really really good to have that. Yeah. Yeah, amazing amazing place, huh? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So many cool wars and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, straight down to the sea. Not many places you can uh, put your take your skis off on the beach. <laughs> yep, and it's always good. It's always really safe snow as well. That's one, one thing that I like about it too. And, and it's also low altitude, so it's easy to walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the 6,000 meters things. No, I know. I uh, <laughs> went a few years ago. I couldn't believe the difference when you're with, it, with the, yeah. the lack of altitude. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah you just yeah. run up. Yeah, yeah, it's mental. Yeah, it's, it's like you suddenly uh, became Killian Journey or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, what, what can, it, what can it people expect to see coming out of your project and when, when can they see it? Uh, this is going to be the first episode coming out uh, on the 4th of February. So it's going to be on uh, redbull.com uh, mainly. And then, uh, and then there's going to be three or four more episodes throughout the winter. And then we'll keep the rest of the footage for the fall. So that gives us a bit more slack to, to doing cool things and to also enjoy uh, the, the end of the season like April, May, where that's usually what you get the best um, big mountain riding. And that's when people are not really interested in watching snow content, so we keep it for the fall. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, there's going to be... Yeah, I don't know. I think people should expect to see what is, uh, like, our real life uh, from the inside. That's really what I want to capture. And, and all that film in a way where everybody could be doing it. So something that's really a lot more accessible, and I hope... Um, that people get inspired by that, by yeah, inspired to go out, inspired to go into an adventure because that's what it all, it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, I've got to ask, can, can we get one of these drones already? Can we? When yeah, yeah, yeah. The drones, you just get them on uh, hexoplus.com. That's the best way to get them. You just order them and it will take a week or two until you have it. So. Oh, right. So now this is it. We're on it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that has got to be done. I'm going to. Uh, yeah. I'm actually going to get on there right now. And it's, uh, <laughs> the the big irony of Fat Map is uh, to end up spending more time staring at computers than going skiing. But uh, <laughs> hopefully, when I do, I'll be able to capture it on my on on a hexo. So looking forward to checking it out. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, Zav. Really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy man. So um, thanks for speaking to us. Um, Thanks for sharing about your adventure, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing what comes out of your, well, your journey. And thanks, Misha, and thanks for all those great fat maps, and I'm, I'm going to be using them all the time. So.
So you'll hear feedback from me. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. Keep it coming. Cool. All right. Speak soon. Speak Ciao. soon. Bye.